And uh, to start us off, we have Professor Tom Hurdle, from, um, uh, who is the Distinguished Professor of Agricultural Economics at Purdue University. His research focuses on the global impacts of trade, climate, and environmental policies. Uh, his most recent research has focused on the impacts of climate change and mitigation policies on global trade, land use, and poverty. This work has built on his substantial prior body of research on the impacts of multilateral trade agreements, including the linkages between global trade policies and poverty in developing countries. So Professor Hurdle, thank you and welcome. Well, good morning. Um, I'm really honored to be here. I want to thank uh, Peter Fairburg and the Scientific Committee for giving me the chance to come. Um, uh, there aren't a lot of economists at these meetings, but I think there's tremendous opportunity for future collaboration. So we're trying to um, chart that course and, and, and look for opportunities for collaboration between these communities. Um, so it's very exciting for me to be here, and I'm really looking forward to uh, the next two days. Um, the title of my talk is Global Change and the Challenges of Sustainably Feeding a Growing Planet. And um, I've organized it around six themes, population and income, um, traditional drivers of change, and on down this list. I will tackle them one at a time. I'll start with population because historically that has been the major driver of change, change, uh, change in the agricultural system, at least in terms of measure, measured in terms of cropland conversion. Um, here I present, um, so from time to time I'll refer back to these um, colored bar charts. And um, on the left of this uh, bar chart you see a column uh, that with a number on it and that um, indicates cropland uh, change over this period. This is a historical period 1961 to 2006. And we've developed a very simple model, in fact it's called simple. Um, a simplified international model of prices, land use, and the environment. And, and um, we published uh, a paper validating the model over this period. And so we have a reasonably valid model for looking at global change over this period. And it allows us to, so it's like putting on a pair of glasses and looking at this da these data again and seeing some more resolution. In this case, we are able to decompose the drivers of change and um, in this case, we're focused on population, the red bar, income, the orange, and technology, the green. You notice that um, income and population are pushing land use change up. Technology is diminishing that. And on net over this period, despite the fact that crop, land, crop production went up by 200%, there was less than a 20% increase in crop area. Amazing accomplishment in terms of technology intensification, not just yields, but but irrigation, multiple cropping, and so on, um, it's really remarkable. And um, one can gain some um, hope from that looking forward if we can replicate that in the future, but that's the question. So as we look to the future and think about these drivers, um, the first thing uh, I will, I'll build up a future scenario for you sequentially. So the first thing we do is just say, well, what if the future were like the past? Okay, same model, same drivers, same cumulative rate of change over this period. Kind of trivial question, but a nice starting point, and you get the same answer. So um, cropland change would be about the, uh, the same over the same number of years. But we know more about the future. We know, in particular, let's start with population, the most important historical driver. We know that population growth rates are slowing. There's a lot of uncertainty, but less so around the 2050 uh, time period. Um, <clears throat> we know there are going to be billions of people added, and we hear a lot in the media about the billions of people that need to be fed. But if you look at this in another way, it's not so daunting. Think about the absolute increment every year to population, and that's already declining, and it's because of the declining growth rate. So if there's a foot race going on here, which there is between, in some sense, technology and improvements, and population, maybe technology doesn't have to run as fast uh, in the coming decades. And it's, it's a point that's been overlooked, I think, um, by just because billions of people sound like a lot, and they are. The other important thing to note is that the billions of people, the growth is in different places now. Historically, over the historical period, a lot of the population growth was still in what are 
called the OECD or the richer countries. These are countries, if you add another person in Germany, the weight in terms of global consumption is much larger than adding another person in Mozambique. They're lighter on the global system. Their consumption level and the composition of their consumption is less. So with the population growing, well, most of this, a lot of this occurring in Africa, um, the weight of the growth, not only are the annual increments um, slowing, but the, where the population is growing is putting less pressure on. So as a result, there's a remarkable change um, <coughs> coming, and that has to do with population becoming much less significant as a driver um, in, uh, from now to 2050, you know, despite all of what we hear in the media. And in fact, if nothing else changed, if income growth, not only rates, but where it grew, if technology grew at the same rates around the world as it did in the past, we'd be in, a, in great shape in terms of the GLP concerns uh, that there would actually be room for um, <coughs> uh, reducing cropland. But that's not the end of the story. Um, income is an important driver of demand as well. And uh, this um, interesting trapezoidal <laughs> figure just illustrates the fact that as living standards rise, um, so we go up in this trapezoid, not only does the quantity of food consumed rise, but the type of food uh, changes. And we've, I've seen pre a lot of presentations already yesterday on highlighting the importance of changing composition of diets and how that can drive land use change in emissions and so on. And that's certainly shown here. Livestock products, um, certainly um, the, rich, the richer diets that would be um, seen in Germany or UK or the United States would, um, would involve more land use requirements. And so we see the orange bar actually contributing more now than, than population. So I would say for the first time in recorded history, and I think in all of human history, population will, uh, income will exceed population in terms of importance as a driver of cropland change. And I think that's a remarkable phenomenon um, and one uh, not to be overlooked. So even though um, <coughs> that individual in Mozambique adding another one of them right now um, won't put as much weight on the global system. As they upgrade their diet, that is through the income channel, um, it's very important uh, that the more rapid income growth is likely to occur in the developing countries. And that's what adds more weight to the income driver now. So income and population, they're distinct analytically. Uh, they interact, obviously, and income will be more important as a driver between now and 2050. Okay, but that's not the end of the story. That's kind of history. Um, looking at history and projecting forward, sticking with the same drivers, but they're new drivers of change, both on the demand and the supply side. And obviously biofuels is one that's caught up a lot of our attention, um, and that relates to energy prices as well as environmental concerns. Um, biofuels have been very important over the last decade. And I think you'll notice that biofuel, interest in biofuels waxes and wanes with oil prices. Uh, not surprisingly, because the viability, commercial viability of biofuels depends very much on the product for which it's substituting. At high oil prices, renewable fuel standards are popular um, not only because they're less costly, but um, energy security looms larger, and they're just more likely to be sustained. Um, and, um, <clears throat> but we've seen um, <clears throat> a slowdown or in fact a flattening of oil prices. Futures oil prices in the U.S. are flat over the next couple of years. Um, the expectation in markets is that oil prices won't be rising. That isn't the IEA forecast, the International Energy Agency, but it's a possibility. At low oil prices, interest in biofuel diminishes. We've seen in the U.S. and the EU it, their environmental concerns, but also the oil prices and other aspects have played a role in um, backing off of some of these ambitious renewable fuel standards. And that um, makes a big difference in terms of land use. Energy prices also affect the cost of intensification. intensification. Low oil prices, low energy prices, low gas prices. Natural gas means cheap fertilizer. Cheaper irrigation encourages more intensification. So energy prices are an important driver of, um, of land use change. And um, I, we illustrate this here. This isn't the simple model. It's a different framework. It's looking forward further in time 
actually several hundred years. Here I've just cut it at 2100. And we've contrasted uncertainty in climate impacts taken from the recent AGMIP project uh, studying climate change and the impact on crop production. Um, we've drawn out the implications for land use here. Uncertainty in regulation, we contrast a no climate regulation scenario to a stabilization scenario uh, focused on land-based mitigation, a topic that I know was featured in the plenaries yesterday, a very important topic, I think, for the future. And we contrast that with uncertainty in energy prices. Here we're contrasting a flat energy price world with the baseline forecast for from, say, the U.S. Department of Energy or the IEA, which has steadily rising prices over this, uh, over this century. And the most important driver of um, land use change in 2100 to the tune of 400 million hectares is the uncertainty in energy prices. So we, it's very important for those interested in land use to be interested in energy markets to be interested in these linkages, both through intensification and through uh, uh, incentives to produce biofuels. And we, I add here just a, a current policy scenario to that layering, and we see that adding this new source of demand moves us up into positive territory in terms of cropland change. But there are other drivers, drivers um, on the supply side. Water is one that's attracted a lot of attention um, recently. Water scarcity is going to face, is going to shape future land use and future patterns of trade. And I want to illustrate that with two papers that we've worked on. Um, the first focuses on the pattern of land use change that comes from growth in biofuels demand. So something we've done extensively is to go back to the beginning of the biofuels boom ramp up, in this case, U.S. biofuels and ask where, um, where was land use change likely to occur as a result of that, contrast that with what actually happened, and study that interaction between energy and land in more detail. We find when we add water to that energy, land, water nexus, um, and we factor in physical constraints to expansion of irrigation, the story changes. So almost all of these studies of indirect land use change, up to the point this was published, all of them, had ignored irrigation rain-fed distinction. The assumption was you expand cropland. So if, if in the model you don't distinguish them, they're in a sense both rain-fed and irrigated lands are, are expanding. But in fact, they aren't equal. They aren't equal in potential for expansion. So if we reflect the International Water Management Institute's predictions of areas of physical scarcity and absolute physical scarcity, so the areas where it's unlikely to get further expansion, and we constrain that, the pattern of land use changes significantly. And the emissions, more importantly, change dramatically. And the reason is irrigated yields are, gen on average, much higher than rain-fed yields. So if you don't allow expansion of irrigated area, you've got to expand rain-fed more than you thought you did. You expand rain-fed more, well, Rain-fed, the ag agroecological zones where rain-fed agriculture is predominant are more carbon rich, both above and below ground. As a result, you get more carbon releases, uh, more, um, and uh, so you're converting more land and more carbon rich land, and the emissions go up by 25%. I think this is a, an excellent example of how um, economists get the answer wrong if they don't interact with the uh, biophysical community, in this case with the hydrologists, um, who understand the potential. Um, so there's a very important interplay here. Um, water scarcity, future water scarcity, will also shape um, uh, future food trade. And this is collaborative work um, um, <coughs> with IFPRI. I see Claudia Ringler up there. Hello, Claudia. So her excellent work and that of her colleagues um, <coughs> has allowed us to um, estimate um, how um, an index of future scarcity of water for irrigation. And this is going from the year 2000 to 2030. And um, so you can see in these food production units um, where um, <coughs> scarcity is expected to intensify. That's the red. So red means intensive intensification of scarcity. Well, the first thing you notice is it's not all over the world. You see a lot of write-ups of water scarcity in the future, and it sounds like everyone's going to be scarce of water. It's a very localized phenomenon and very intensive, uh, intense in some areas. And I've circled um, areas of South Asia and China uh, for that reason here. 
Um, so increasing water scarcity, what does that do to trade? Well, we've taken this analysis um, from IFPRI and we've used it in the context of a, um, a global trade model um, to look at the way in which this would change trade patterns. So the, the deficit, uh, some of the most extreme deficits are in Pakistan and the rest of South Asia. And the rest of South Asia region here um, is shown uh, what we've depicted in this uh, lovely graphic that Jing Lu put together. She's the lead author, author on this paper, is showing where the additional food trade, the additional food imports would come from for the rest of South Asia um, <clears throat> confronting this uh, water scarcity. So keeping everything else constant, increased water scarcity, what does that do to food trade? And you can see there's some significant changes in food trade, particularly increased trade from the regions that aren't affected, and much of Europe is one of those regions. This shows imports into India and China, and this is the whole uh, nexus. So um, future water scarcity will shape land use change, and it'll shape food trade, and as a result, um, um, you know, it's, it's a very interesting uh, phenomenon. Um, adaptation to climate change is also an important aspect. So climate change impacts as well as adaptation can affect land use. Uh, this is from a study with David Lobel and Uris Baldos um, where we looked at the effect of successfully adapting to temperature and precipitation changes um, uh, between uh, 2006 and 2050. And um, so we haven't worried about, you can see a CO2 effect there. We haven't changed that. We're not talking about adapting to that. That is um, uh, ongoing. What we're focused on is R&D aimed at uh, mitigating the adverse effects of temperature and precipitation changes. We estimate that cost to be about $225 billion. And um, as a result, because adverse climate effects cause yields to fall relative to baseline, uh, you need more land to feed the world. Um, <clears throat> if you could adapt to that successfully via this R&D investment, you could spare some land. So this is a land sparing story um, through R&D, and we find that adaptation is really a competitive, um, is competitive with other mitigation alternatives at $15 per ton CO2e is the median uh, uh, price, and this spares land around the world relative to baseline. Baseline, uh, there'd be more land conversion because of these adverse effects. Um, the sparing effect here is shown to be dominant in Latin America and Africa. I want to bring up a topic that was uh, brought up yesterday. I know Billy Turner brought it up, and I think others, um, about the importance of land in general in the mitigation um, picture, and land as a provider of other public goods. I think this competition will become more important in the future than it has been in the past. So the historical analysis, we didn't factor that in. In the future, I think it will be very important. Land is um, a source of many important public goods, biodiversity and mitigation, mitigation um, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> recreational services. There are many things that the, the world is going to demand much more of in the future, and that's going to be competitive with agriculture. Um, I'm focusing here on um, mitigation, and I'm drawing on a study um, uh, with the co-author Ala Golub and others uh, published in PNAS in 2012, where we focused on the uh, impacts of implementing a red plus type scenario worldwide. Um, we incentivize not only um, <clears throat> reduced deforestation, but also afforestation and also um, managing the forests for carbon, which generates a very different profile of um, vintages and types of forest. And um, we find that um, this is combined, these scenarios all involve also an Annex 1 emission scenario with taxes as well as um, uh, incentives for forest carbon sequestration. But the main focus is on the red plus component in the developing countries. So global for carbon sequestration incentives for forests um, increase future forest land relative to baseline very significantly. And that has an impact on cropland because ultimately there's a competition here uh, between forests and pasture and cropland. So less cropland in the future means um, higher food prices and um, that's something we've subsequently drawn out in a follow-up paper to look at 
uh, the potential poverty impacts of that. So there's competition between this providing this global public good, the carbon sequestration, on the one hand, between, between feeding the world on the other, and um, that tension results in, um, you, you see environmental and poverty food security trade-offs that we're highlighting here. This is a bit of a complicated figure, and I'll refer you to, uh, to the uh, paper, source paper, um, <coughs> um, on this to look at it in more detail. But basically, we went out and got household survey data in a set of countries, uh, 14 here. We've expanded this to more than 30 countries now. Um, and we group the households into different strata depending on where they get their income. And um, that's very important in determining how they'll be affected because poor households are not only affected by food prices, they're affected by uh, earnings, especially labor earnings, wages, because mostly what the poor have is their own labor. And the thing that we find here um, each circle refers to a different socioeconomic stratum. The size of the, the area of the circle di dictates how large that is in terms of overall poverty in the country. And the gray bars aggregate those, uh, what's happening in those circles to show what's happening to overall national poverty in a range of countries ranging from India um, on the left to Latin America and Africa on the right. And overall, we find that poverty um, is driven up by this um, <coughs> global um, sequestration scenario, and the reason is clear in retrospect. Um, higher food prices, the, f the poor spend more of their income on food. They're going to be hurt more, relatively speaking, by the higher food prices. They don't own a lot of land. This policy, the only policy aspect we're implementing in the developing countries is one boosting land returns. So the main effect in the developing countries is to bid up land prices. Well, if you don't own land, or if it's communally held land on which you don't have a significant claim on the returns, you don't benefit. Let me wrap up here. I've been given the five-minute signal. Uh, technological progress is the one bit I haven't talked about. It's the green bar. And the green bar, in some sense, reflects um, all of our um, <coughs> ignorance. <laughs> um, <coughs> productivity growth, what is that? It's the difference between output growth rate and input growth rate. And it, there are a lot of things buried in there. And you can see over the historical period, that's been important. Um, we contrast two scenarios here, one in which productivity grows at the historically fastest, fastest growth rate over the fastest two decades in this historical period, and the other is the slowest two decades. And you can see that it makes a significant difference in how much land use change will occur um, in, in the future. So we need to worry more about productivity growth Productivity growth is especially important for food prices. You'll see in our baseline forecast, we actually have food prices flat to declining. Uh, it's a pretty robust result. If you refer to the paper referenced here, um, we don't agree with those projecting a new normal with food prices rising in the future. And it's because largely of this population change that I emphasized at the beginning. But you can see, depending on the rate of technological progress, you could see very different food, food price paths in the future. We need to pay more attention to that. So I'm ready to wrap up there, Riku. So we have some time for questions. I um, just wanted to thank some collaborators here um, pictorially. Yeah. I think we have time for questions, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay, let me, uh, yeah, I'll clarify a little more on that because it seems like a really important, uh, first of all, let me say that that aspect of the work was led by Brent Sanjin. He does, he is, for 20 years, he's been doing global forestry modeling. So in his analysis, there is, um, um, of course, regional breakdown, different types of trees growing at different rates. Um, you harvest them at different vintages depending on their, um, initially, depending on their commercial value. But as we introduce this incentive, uh, incentive 
um, to uh, you're paid for the carbon on your land, you have an incentive, first of all, not to convert land. So, of course, I just saw a figure cited yesterday, 40 percent of the um, <clears throat> over the last uh, decade, 40 percent of the cropland, new cropland in the tropics from uh, coming from forests that doesn't happen or doesn't happen as much in the future. That means less cropland relative to baseline and more intensive competition for land, higher food prices. So it's through the land competition that that's arising. Um, and when you have the carbon incentive, of course, you manage your forests differently as well. You manage it for carbon, and that may mean longer. Um, you don't harvest it until later, a longer vintage. Um, an older vintage when you harvest it. Um, there, of course, the forests are also a source of income and food for the poor in many parts of the world, and we haven't factored that in here. So it's the food is coming from agriculture. Yes? If you broke down your three columns in different, um, that had different TFP scenarios into regional change, I'm wondering what you would expect to see because um, income has an, an effect on whether people are purchasing more stable versus non-stable crops, and those non-stable crops tend to be expanding more in tropical areas. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering if you guys have looked at that at all and where you would expect to see those changes. Yeah, we did, and I had to cut out the slide that showed the composition of growth and food demand. Um, we distinguish between three, it's a simple model, simple approach, very aggregate. We distinguish between three, three different sources of demand. Consume the crops directly, consume it through livestock, or consume it through processed food. And all the growth, virtually all the growth is from livestock and processed food, and it varies according to income levels, as you indicate. Um, and the productivity growth is not linked directly to the income growth here. The productivity growth is based on exogenous projections, but we are building a database on R&D stocks. Ultimately, productivity really depends. Productivity 20 years from now is depending on what we're investing today to a great degree. So we should be able to predict that pretty well if we can establish that relationship, and that's what we're working on. I found myself wondering the extent to which you were able to take account of uh, decisions that governments make about the instruments that influence all these five, six areas. Yeah. Um, looking at Russia on the one hand, which has more land than anyone else, but pretty low population, and uh, the other extreme countries like China, which are pretty threatened by this. Um, so the, the kind of policymakers' reactions and the extent to which they are prepared to work for international goals rather than national goals. Is that something you can factor in? Yeah, there are two very interesting aspects to your question. One is that the fundamental difference between, say, Russia and China, land abundance, the type of technology, the type of techniques. And that's factored in to the analysis, but your overriding question, that of government policies and government actions, um, are not a focus here um, in this long-run analysis. Of course, a lot of my other work has focused up directly on the effect of policies, trade policies, domestic policies for agriculture and so on. Um, yeah, but we haven't brought that in here. And if you think, you know, if you're thinking 50 years, governments can change, <laughs> policies can change. And in that sense, um, it's very interesting to look at the underlying drivers of supply and demand, uh, um, and um, then bring in, obviously, different policy scenarios. But I'm abstracting from it here, uh, to be honest. Yeah, not, not, good point. 